welcome to the September webinar of the NASA Night Sky Network. This month, we welcome Mitch Schulte to our webinar, who will bring us up to date on plans for the Mars 2020 rover. Dr. Mick Schulte is a program scientist with the Mars Exploration Program in NASA's Science Mission Directorate. As a program scientist, Mitch manages the science content of a number of NASA's Mars missions. As a researcher, he studies the geology and geochemistry of hydrothermal environments and the life that inhabits them. He has an AB and a PhD, both in Earth and Planetary Sciences from Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. So please welcome Mitch Schulte. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for dialing in this, uh, this evening. Uh, it's great. Uh, so can, can you guys hear me? I just want to do a sound check and make sure you guys can hear me okay. Yep, we can hear you great. Fantastic. Okay, let me share my slides with you then. And we will get started. Okay, uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, my name is Mitch Schulte. I'm a program scientist um, at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And uh, what I want to talk to you about tonight is um, our next mission to Mars. We've been sending spacecraft to Mars for about uh, 50 years now, a little over 50 years. Uh, and we've learned a lot, but there's still a lot that we want to uh, find out. So we're uh, planning a new Mars rover mission. Um, it's uh, pretty much uh, complete, completely built now and is undergoing what we call environmental testing so that we're sure that it can survive uh, the trip um, all the way to Mars and then uh, survive once it gets there. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures a little later on uh, from the high bay at uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where they're building the rover so that you guys can all see uh, the great progress that we've made. So uh, without further ado, I'll uh, launch right into my presentation here. So I want to give you a quick overview of what the mission um, will do. So we're going to launch the rover uh, like we did with Curiosity on an Atlas V 541. Uh, so this is one of our workhorse uh, launch vehicles uh, and does really well. So we're going to use the same uh, launching system for sending Mars 2020 rover uh, as we sent, uh, as we used for Curiosity. So the launch readiness date will be July of 2020. Everything is on track. As I mentioned, the rover is largely built now and is undergoing environmental tests. Uh, so we're definitely on schedule to meet our um, July of 2020 launch date. So the first uh, day that will be possible for launching, launching the rover to Mars will be uh, July 17. So mark your calendars uh, for that date. Uh, once it's on its way, uh, it will take about seven months for the rover to arrive at Mars. So uh, it will be a direct uh, trajectory and a direct entry into Mars. So no going into orbit and landing. It'll just go straight there and go straight to the ground. Uh, it will arrive in February of 2021. So um, mark your calendars for that as well. Uh, and then that's when the fun starts and we get to do all the great science. Um, but before we get to the ground, of course, we have to put it on the ground. Um, this uh, little um, animation here is what it looked like, we think, uh, when Curiosity landed on Mars. Um, the engineers at the Jet Propulsion Lab uh, came up with this sky crane idea because the rover uh, for Curiosity is about almost 900 kilograms, and so it was too heavy to land any other way. So they devised this uh, sky crane uh, to land the rover on Mars. So. The Mars 2020 rover is actually going to weigh a little bit more than the Curiosity rover. So the last estimate I saw for the, for the mass of the Mars 2020 rover is on the order of 1050 kilograms, 1050 kilograms, so over a metric ton. Uh, but we're going to use the same sky crane system to land the Mars 2020 rover on the ground. Um, we do have a couple of uh, improvements in the landing system that we've built into the system this time. Um, one is, like, Mar like Curiosity, it will have guided entry, so the back shell will have um, little uh, retro rockets on it, so it will be able to guide uh, the spacecraft as it's coming in once it hits the top of the atmosphere of Mars. As it's coming through the atmosphere, it will deploy the parachutes and then uh, deploy the um, sky crane system that you see here. Uh, but we have two uh, improvements in that landing system. One is called range trigger. 
Uh, this will allow us, once we're in the, in the right place, we can deploy the parachute uh, at the right time so that we'll get closer to our landing uh, ellipse. The other one is TRN, which is Terrain Relative Navigation. So this will be a series of images that will be loaded into the software on the rover. Um, the rover, as it's looking down at the ground, will compare what it sees with its radar to the images that are loaded on board so that it will be able to divert from any uh, big obstacles that it sees and uh, have a, a safe landing. So that landing ellipse uh, figure that you see there under the, the entry, descent, and landing uh, uh, heading of 16 by 14 will actually be a lot smaller. Uh, and we think it will be on the order of about six by eight or eight by 10 kilometers. So a lot smaller, we'll be able to get a lot closer to the rocks so we can start doing science right away. Um, once we get on the ground, then we will have um, one Mars year to complete our prime mission. The rover will be built with the capability of going about 20 kilometers across the surface. The Curiosity rover just went past 21 kilometers during its drives. It's been on the ground for about seven years, but we'll be able to do that. Um, technically, we'll be able to do that 20 kilometers in one year if we need to. Um, we've qualified all of the hardware on the rover mission to last for one and a half Mars years, just to give us a little bit of uh, extra um, cushion in terms of the, uh, the, the warranty, as it were, for the, all the hardware on the, uh, on the rover. Now, I'll talk about what our... Um, um, mission objectives are in the next slide here. So we have four major objectives for the mission. The first, all the way on the left-hand side of the slide, is geologic exploration. So as a geologist, the first thing you wanna do when you're investigating a new field area is go out and case the place. So we want to <laughs> explore um, primarily an ancient terrain, and I'll talk um, towards the end here about where we're actually going to send the rover. Uh, but we, what we want to look at is an ancient environment on Mars. So what we're trying to find are signs of life, as I'll talk about in a second. And so we think our best chance to find evidence for life in the rocks on Mars is to go way back in Mars's history when it was much more Earth-like uh, than it is today. As I'm sure you all know, Mars today is very cold and dry and dusty at the surface. Liquid water is not stable at the surface right now. But we see evidence in the really old rocks on Mars that there was liquid water at the surface in Mars's ancient geologic past. So we'll be sending the rover to one of these ancient terrains, and we really want to understand the geology of the area so that we understand the environmental conditions that attended um, that particular area so that we um, understand better the chances for uh, seeking those signs of life through understanding processes of the formation of the rocks that we see uh, and any alteration events that have happened to them since. So the second mission objective, as I uh, alluded to, is uh, seeking signs of life. So again, we're not looking for uh, life at the surface now. What we're looking for is evidence in the rock record that life may have left behind an imprint. Um, so what you see in that image uh, in the second panel uh, is an image of uh, a type of rock that we call a stromatolite. These are microfossils that are formed by uh, microorganisms, and uh, it leaves these imprints in the rock record. And so this is one of the kinds of things that we're, we're hoping to maybe find when we go uh, to Mars. So we're looking for evidence of past life, again, in the rock record on Mars. We're also going to be looking for uh, areas to select samples with high potential for preserving that evidence of life. And we refer to this evidence as potential biosignatures. So um, when you go look at these places on Earth, um, you see these, the evidence in the rocks. And a lot of times it's very difficult to convince people that what you're seeing actually is evidence of life, from, especially in really old rocks. And so we want to gather as many lines of evidence as possible in the rocks. Um, and then what we also want to do related to our third objective, which is the next panel, is prepare a returnable cache of samples. So we'll have the capability um, with the rover to collect, I think 43 is the number of sample tubes that we have now. Uh, so we'll be able to collect over 40 samples. Uh, we want to take blanks as witnesses to make sure that we understand any contamination vectors so that what, when we 
bring these samples back to Earth and study them, we are sure that what we're seeing is actually Martian and not something that we brought with us and then brought home with us um, in those sample tubes. So what we really want to do is um, not just collect samples that uh, give us information about these potential biosignatures, but we're also interested in other kinds of samples as well. So we're hoping to collect a geologic diversity of samples. Um, what we're currently planning to do is deposit these samples on the ground um, in a, what we call a depot. So we'll put them in all sort of in similar places or put piles of rocks, uh, sample tubes uh, in a couple of different places. Uh, and we're currently working on um, obtaining permission to start the next mission that would be the mission to go retrieve those samples. And I'll talk briefly about that towards the end uh, of the talk here as well. Uh, and then our final objective for this mission is to prepare for humans eventually to explore Mars. So we have two instruments on board the rover uh, that will help uh, with that. One will be um, a weather package, and I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later as well. Uh, and we have a, um, a, a technology demonstration to extract oxygen out of Mars's atmosphere. So we call this in situ resource utilization or ISRU. Um, and I'll talk briefly about that uh, instrument on board the rover as well. So this is an artist depiction of what the rover looks like. Again, it may look familiar to you. Um, the chassis is essentially a copy of the Curiosity rover. Uh, we know that rover is working very well, and we decided uh, to, in order to save uh, money, we would just reuse that design rather than coming up with a brand new design. Uh, it does have an entirely new instrument uh, package. Um, some of them are a little bit derivative of what we saw with Curiosity, and I'll go through each of the instruments. Um, but a couple of uh, things to point out here. Uh, one, this rover-like Curiosity will be nuclear powered, so no solar panels, so you won't see solar panels on here. Um, way out at the, uh, on the right-hand side, you see what we call the turret. This is out at the end of the robotic arm, uh, and we have a couple of uh, instruments out there um, to uh, really interrogate the rocks in very fine detail, and I'll talk about those instruments individually. Uh, and that's, of course, where the drill that will be collecting the samples will sit. So we'll talk about all this as we go along. One other note that I'll make is that uh, you see that the wheels uh, look different than Curiosity's wheels, if you pay attention to what the wheels look like on Curiosity. Uh, we've determined, of course, that um, the wheels on Curiosity are developing a lot of uh, holes in them and some tears in the aluminum. So we had to redesign the wheels to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So the, the uh, folks at JPL have uh, redesigned those wheels, and you'll see that they're uh, a little bit narrower than Curiosity's wheels. Uh, the aluminum is a little bit thicker, uh, and the tread pattern is a little bit different. And they've tested these out at JPL, uh, and they've not been able to poke any holes in them, uh, unlike Curiosity's wheels. So we are happy with that redesign of the wheels. So let's uh, take a quick look at uh, all of the instruments on board the rover uh, right up front here. So again, what we did was we selected a payload of instruments to measure uh, primarily fine scale mineralogy. Uh, we want to get at elemental composition uh, and we want to, again, detect potential biosignatures. So this instrument package was really designed uh, to sort of get down to the level of microorganisms, which is what we think the nature of life on early Mars would have been. Uh, and so we designed this uh, instrument package to, uh, to accommodate those uh, goals. So you see all of the instruments listed on here. I'll go through them one by one, so I won't talk about them individually here, um, except to mention uh, that, of course, this is also a very international mission, and you see the flags of uh, a few different countries represented here. Uh, and we've been very happy working with our international partners on um, on this, on providing the instruments, and of course we're looking forward to working with them once the, uh, the rover gets on the ground. So let's go through these uh, one by one. Uh, I'll go through them relatively quickly um, and take any questions at the end that you might have. Um, so the first the instrument that I wanna talk about is Mast Cam Z. Uh, as you could tell from the name, this is on the mast, the thing that sticks up off of the rover deck, uh, highlighted in yellow there um, in the mast are the two cameras that make up mass cam Z. Um, and then the yellow, box, the yellow boxes that you see inside the body of the rover 
represent the electronics uh, that provide power for the cameras. Uh, and then the one at the very back is the calibration target that MassCam uh, looks at when it's trying to make sure that it's got the color balance right. So here you see a couple of pictures. As I mentioned, they've been building the rover uh, and it's largely complete. complete. Um, the image that you see on the left uh, are the technicians uh, actually assembling mass cam Z and putting it onto the mast uh, of the rover. Uh, it's the little cameras down below where you see the big red circle. That's actually a different instrument that we'll talk about in a minute. They're the, the rectangular boxes below that and then another one off to the left. Uh, so again, uh, the image on the right, you can see them a little bit better. Uh, the two rectangular boxes are um, the mass cams. So this is an image taken with the, um, uh, the mass cam on Curiosity. So it's the same uh, principal investigator, Jim Bell at Arizona State, who is providing the, uh, the, the instrument for Mars 2020. Uh, this is the kind of image, though. This is an actual image taken from the surface of Mars with Curiosity. Uh, just showing you the, the great detail that these cameras actually provide for us. We can actually see a lot of uh, great geologic formations here. Uh, we can see differences between rocks. We can see the layering in the rocks and all that kind of stuff. The improvement that MassCam Z is going to provide is imagine this picture zoomed three times. So we'll be able to actually uh, zoom in on uh, these distant vistas with mass cam Z so that we'll be able to get a lot more uh, detailed information from far away. <clears throat> Here's another image. This one's a little bit closer up of, uh, you can again see the layering in the rocks. Uh, this one has been a little bit color balanced. So to uh, bring out some of the detail that you can see, which uh, represents some differences in, the, in the, uh, the nature of the materials that make up these rocks uh, and to enhance the layering so that you can see that uh, in fine detail. So another great thing, since this is the uh, Astronomical Society of the Pacific, I thought I would show you these two images. Uh, these were also taken with mass cam on Curiosity. Uh, the image on the left uh, is a transit of Phobos, the, large, the larger moon of Mars across the face of the sun. Uh, and the image on the right uh, is Deimos, the smaller moon also transiting across the sun. So we can do some astronomy from the surface of Mars uh, with the mass cam as well. Now the next instrument I want to talk about is SuperCam. Uh, so SuperCam is also up there on the top of the mast, um, the yellow image there um, just above the mast cam. Uh, and then of course the, uh, the yellow box inside the body of the rover is the electronics to uh, support the SuperCam. So let's take a look at what SuperCam is all about. So SuperCam uh, is an enhanced ChemCam. So some of you may be familiar with ChemCam, which is the laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy instrument on uh, the Curiosity rover. SuperCam um, is ChemCam plus a few things. So in addition to having the LIBS, or the laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, which measures the chemical composition of the rocks, uh, SuperCam will also have a laser Raman instrument to be able to look for uh, alteration mineralogy and for um, uh, organic material, although the sensitivity is uh, a little bit less than the Sherlock instrument that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but from afar, it will be able to look for these kinds of signatures and it will be able to do it rapidly. Uh, and then the other, the other part of SuperCam that makes it super above ChemCam is that it will have a visible and near-infrared spectrometer to do mineralogy uh, of rocks, again, from really far away. So um, from meters away, we'll be able to rapidly assess uh, what's going on in rocks and decide whether they're uh, worth investigating uh, more closely. So what you see in this image um, is um, before and after the laser that is used um, to make these measurements is fired. And so you see uh, the rock uh, in the before image is nice uh, surface there unaltered. And then after uh, the laser was fired to measure the chemistry of that rock, uh, you see the little pits that the, uh, the laser made in the, in the, inside the yellow circle there. So again, using the uh, laser, this gives us a rapid uh, method for doing this again from afar. So this gives us a great, um, Surveil uh, surveillance kind of uh, technology and capability for uh, assessing the nature of the materials very quickly. 
another very uh, great thing about being able to use these lasers is that we'll be able to um, look into the holes that we make once we start uh, taking our samples. So we don't actually want to have any of the instruments touch the samples for, um, again, for contamination kinds of issues. Uh, but once we take a sample, we'll be able to look inside the hole that we've made. Uh, and you see this image here taken, um, again, from Curiosity after they had drilled a hole uh, of some laser shots going down the walls of the side of the hole that they had dug. Um, so that you can, uh, again, get some idea about what the, the nature of the sample is just by looking at the material that you've left behind. Uh, so here are some of the uh, kinds of uh, data uh, that uh, the ChemCam takes um, when it's doing its analyses. And so you can see uh, the, the axis on the left is intensity or the number of counts that it gets uh, in the spectrometer. Uh, as a function of wavelength on the x-axis. Um, so you, and you can see that in uh, nanometers. So it goes all the way from ultraviolet out to the, the near infrared. Uh, and again, what we get from ChemCam largely is um, the chemical information. So this spectrum uh, that they took uh, from this rock uh, essentially is a basalt, which is not surprising, which is because that's the most common rock type on Mars. Uh, and so this just shows you uh, that these data uh, are actually um, fairly well calibrated and actually do a great job of telling us relatively rapidly uh, what the rocks are made out of in terms of its chemical composition. Now I wanna move on to the uh, instruments that are out on the turret or out on the end of the arm of the rover. So you can see them uh, in, so you can see Sherlock and Watson in yellow out there on the turret. Again, the uh, electronics inside the body of the rover. Now Sherlock and Watson uh, come as a pair and um, I'll talk about each of these individually. I'll talk about Watson first. So Watson is a, um, the companion in this case of Sherlock, but it's, a, uh, it's essentially a microscopic imager. So it's a sort of a, a hand lens so that we can um, look at things uh, relatively up close. It is also the um, instrument that is used on Curiosity to take these lovely selfies of the rover as it sits on the surface of Mars. So they take a bunch of pictures uh, with the, uh, the, the instrument called Molly on uh, curiosity and stitch them all together to make these beautiful selfies. And I'm certain that you will see many selfies from Mars 2020 as well. Uh, but the real purpose, of course, of that uh, microscopic imager is to uh, really study the materials in fine detail. So for example, if you're looking at a nice sediment on the surface uh, and you really want to understand the processes that uh, were involved in creating that sediment, uh, you really need to understand the shape of the materials, you need to understand how well rounded they are, you need to understand whether they're all the same size or whether they're different sizes. Uh, and so this particular image taken from uh, uh, Molly on Curiosity also shows you very up close uh, the nature of these materials. So that's one of the great purposes. And of course, uh, as a geologist, when you go out in the field, you always carry your hand lens around so you can see things up close. Uh, we, uh, of course, ask our rovers to do the same thing. Now, SHERLOCK itself is, um, the, the acronym SHERLOCK stands for Scanning Habitable Environments with Raman and Luminescence, and for organics and chemicals. And of course, the purpose of this instrument uh, is twofold. One, to look in very fine scale uh, with high resolution camera at the materials on the surface of Mars. It also has a Raman spectrometer on it and can also analyze luminescence. So luminescence is great uh, when you're looking for organic compounds, especially organic compounds uh, that have uh, aromatic rings in the structure. So when you shine ultraviolet light on these materials, they, uh, they luminesce, they fluoresce in the ultraviolet. And so the laser that is used for the Raman uh, on Sherlock is an ultraviolet laser. I think it's 242 nanometers. Um, so those materials will luminate, will luminesce in ultraviolet. So we'll be able to, to detect that. We'll also be able to take Raman spectra, uh, and again, at very fine scale. So we'll be able to look for organic material. 
uh, and we'll be able to look for particular kinds of minerals in these rocks that indicate presence of liquid water in the past. So what Raman, what a Raman spectrometer does is actually look at chemical bonds uh, inside materials. And so you'll be able to, for example, determine whether there are carbon-carbon bonds, uh, whether there are sulfur-oxygen bonds, for example, in a sulfate kind of mineral, uh, whether there are carbon-oxygen bonds that make up a carbonate material. Um, so we'll be able to find all of these kinds of uh, materials, and again, on a very fine scale. So the um, resolution that we will be able to get with this instrument is on the order of 100 uh, microns. So very, very fine scale. And again, what we're trying to do uh, is look in places where we think microorganisms might have lived, uh, so essentially we're looking for those areas where the water might have been present inside these rocks. Uh, the next instrument I want to talk about is Pixel. So Pixel lives out on the end of the uh, arm and the turret with uh, Sherlock and Watson. Um, and what Pixel stands for is Planetary Instrument for X-ray Lithochemistry. So what that essentially means is that this is an X-ray fluorescence instrument and it will be able to um, determine the chemistry, again, on a very, very fine scale, which we've not been able to do before with the instruments that we've flown to Mars before. So we'll be able to determine the um, makeup of particular chemical elements inside the rocks and the, um, uh, the abundance of those particular elements. So what you see in the bottom left of this image um, is, an energy x-ray spectrum. So again, on the y-axis are the number of counts of x-rays that you get as a function of the energy that you put into it. So there's a high voltage power supply that uh, shines x-rays on the samples. Um, it essentially knocks electrons out of their valences and when those electrons refill, it emits energy, uh, x-ray energy. And because of the uh, electronic arrangement of those elements, it's very diagnostic what the fingerprint is. Uh, and so you can see that we will be able to determine the elemental composition of uh, all the way up to atomic number about 40, uh, which again extends the uh, number of elements that we've been able to do before, and we'll be able to do it uh, with higher precision and at a much finer scale. So the previous instruments we've sent before were whole rock analyzers. This will actually be able to let us see on a very fine scale. So for example, uh, we'll be able to see the, the composition of um, a vein, an alteration vein in a rock by itself and not have to determine that by, by subtraction from uh, doing whole rock chemistry. So the image that you see on the right um, is a series of elemental maps showing you the distribution of um, different elements inside uh, a rock, or the rock that you see on the left-hand side of the picture there. Uh, so if I could draw your attention to the bottom of the picture on the right hand side, you'll see uh, as an example uh, two really two three really interesting things um, In the very far right you'll see a, a little spot labeled zircon So zircon is an, a, an element or is a mineral sorry that allows us to uh, date rocks So if we find zircons in rocks, we'll probably want to try and sample those because that will probably give us a pretty good age uh, when we get those samples back and return those to Earth. We won't be able to do that with the instruments on the rover, but we will be able to do that um, once we bring those samples back. Uh, the other in minerals that you see in those pictures at the bottom of that image are detrital pyrite, which are sulfide minerals, uh, and then magnesium and iron carbonates, which of course um, are uh, often associated with environments where you find uh, microorganisms in both cases. So again, uh, we'll be able to see that at very fine scale, so we'll be able to get down to the level that microorganisms exist in. Uh, so again, to give you an example, here is uh, the, the image on the left. This is um, one of these microfossils that I've talked about before. These are from 3.4 billion year old rocks here on Earth. Um, we call them microbial mats or these stromatolites. Uh, this is a very well-known, um, formation from Western Australia called the Strelly Pool. Um, and this is, these are some of the oldest evidence of life on Earth. And so one of our PIs, uh, the PI for Pixel, who is a native Australian, uh, actually was able to collect a sample of this. 
uh, and they analyzed it with both Pixel and Sherlock. And so uh, we can see the utility of having these two instruments on board the rover uh, in analyzing this um, rock from Earth that is known to be evidence of three and a half billion year old life here on Earth. So what we see there with Pixel are the, the bands uh, where we see carbonates interbedded with silica. Uh, and then the image from Sherlock, we're able to see silicate, the silicate minerals as well. Uh, and we're also able in green to see organic carbon bands uh, that make up the layers where the microorganisms lived uh, and have been preserved uh, all this time. So again, uh, being able to see this on this fine a scale and being able to see this evidence will be uh, spectacular once we get to Mars. Okay, so those are the primary um, four instruments that we're really going to be using for uh, determining uh, surface properties and surface material, uh, getting information about the surface materials. There are a few other instruments on the rover uh, that are also going to tell us a lot about uh, what's going on on Mars. So the first one uh, is RIMFAX. Uh, this is uh, a ground penetrating radar provided by uh, the Norwegians. And uh, what you'll see is the antenna for the radar is mounted just underneath the, uh, the RTG, or the radio, radio isotope thermal electric generator. Um, and then the electronics are mounted on the side uh, of the rover over there. Uh, and so as the rover drives around on the surface of Mars, uh, we will be collecting uh, radar data and it looks something like this. So this may not mean much to you guys, but to a geologist, this is fantastic. What happens is the radar penetrates into the ground. When there's a difference in material properties, those uh, radar, um, the radar energy is reflected back and so that you're able to see differences between properties of materials underneath. So as Mars 2020 is driving around and we're collecting these, ground penetrating radar data, we'll actually be able to see the layering of the materials uh, below the surface. Uh, and again, we're able to do this from orbit, but on a much larger scale. So having this ground penetrating radar on the ground will actually give us a lot more detail about the uh, subsurface structures of the geology that we've not been able to get before. So this will be a really great, um, a really great instrument to have along. Now I mentioned that we're sending two instruments that are going to help us um, help our colleagues in the human exploration um, directorate uh, by providing a lot of data that we're going to need when we send humans to Mars. Uh, the first is uh, the weather station, META. So META is mounted in several different places on the rover because it has several different pieces. Uh, several of them you see are on the mast and a few of them are mounted on the deck of the rover itself. So let's take a quick look at a few of the things that we're going to be able to um, study with META. So META stands for Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. So this will be able to do uh, measurements of the temperature of both the air and the ground. Uh, we'll be able to do relative humidity. We'll be able to measure the wind, both the uh, the speed of the wind and the direction. So we'll have, and in three dimensions, so we'll have two different booms that will measure the wind velocity and direction. Uh, so that'll be pretty great. And then the other thing that we'll have with META is a dust analyzer. So you see the, um, the little box that's highlighted in red there, uh, the dust sensor. So the dust on Mars is very, very fine grained. We think that it could be a problem. It could get into equipment. It could get all over the astronauts' uh, uh, spacesuits. Um, and it could potentially be toxic. So we really want to understand the properties of this dust in terms of um, its size, its shape, um, its mass, all that kind of stuff. And so we'll be able to measure that um, on the ground at Mars with um, this particular instrument. Uh, and then the final instrument that I want to talk about is MOXIE. So MOXIE, of course, uh, is mounted inside the body of the rover. There's nothing that actually sticks out for MOXIE. Um, MOXIE is um, the instrument. It's a technology demonstration to show that we will actually be able to use materials we find at Mars to help us once we have humans at Mars. So MOXIE is a solid oxide electrolysis extraction device. It will, it will ingest 
CO2 from Mars's atmosphere. It will compress it, and then it will send it through this solid oxide electrolysis process where it will strip out the oxygen out of the carbon dioxide. So essentially what it does is it takes CO2, strips out one of the oxygen atoms, um, and then combine, and that will combine with another oxygen atom that is also stripped out. Uh, so we'll be essentially producing um, molecular oxygen. So we will be making oxygen on the surface of Mars that we'll be able to use um, in the distant future, either as um, air for the astronauts to breathe or as an oxidant for rocket fuel. So that will help us get back off the surface of Mars. So again, this is being flown as a technology demonstration, and this is largely funded by the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate and the Space Technology Mission Directorate at headquarters. Okay, so those are the instruments. There are a couple of other um, features that we have on the rover that I wanna talk about briefly. I'm happy to take questions about these if you guys have them. The first is, yes, we are flying a helicopter to Mars. So um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory has built uh, the Mars helicopter. Um, you can see the flight model for it on the bottom right-hand side. So that's the actual flight model of the helicopter that will be going to Mars. The picture in the middle at the top uh, is the technicians actually mounting the helicopter to the belly pan of the rover. So in that image, the, the rover is upside down and they're mounting the helicopter to the bottom of the rover. So what will happen is once the rover lands on the ground, the helicopter will be lowered uh, to the ground. Uh, the rover will drive away from it. Um, the helicopter will then unfold. Uh, and then do a series of uh, short test flights to demonstrate for the very first time aerial flight on Mars. So we've never done this before. As I'm sure you all know, the atmosphere on Mars is very thin, so flying a helicopter there or an aircraft of any kind will be very challenging. And so this is being flown also as a technology demonstration so that we can show for the very first time that we're op able to operate an aerial vehicle on Mars. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, um, we're, of course, planning to collect samples that we are hoping to bring back in the near future. Uh, so the picture on the right-hand side of this slide um, is the technicians installing um, part of the sampling and caching system. So the um, sort of um, circular thing that you see there with the white um, uh, box around it, that's part of the sampling system. A lot of the sampling system is actually inside the rover. That is the, um, the, the sample handling part of the system that connects the outside to the inside. So the tubes, the sample tubes will be stored inside the rover, um, and, but they of course will be collected, uh, the samples will be collected by the drill out on the end of the arm. So that hardware that you see in the image is the, um, the connection between excuse me, the, uh, the arm and the, um, the, the stuff inside the rover that uh, we need to get access to. So we'll bring a sample from inside the rover. It will go through the, it will pass through this hardware uh, and be put into um, the drill. The sample tube will go into the drill uh, out on the end of the arm. So the drawings on the left-hand side that you see um, is the drill bit, uh, and then next to it on the right is the sample tube. So the sample tube will fit inside that drill bit, sample will get collected, it will then get passed back through um, the, um, the hardware to exchange it back into the interior. We'll take a picture of it and we'll seal it up, uh, and then we'll deposit it on the ground. So uh, once we do that, of course, we'll want to be able to bring them back eventually in the future. So we're currently working on plans um, to uh, fly a couple of different missions to go retrieve those samples. So the, this is essentially what the basic notional architecture is uh, for that sample return. Uh, on the left-hand side of this image, there would be a landed, um, a landed mission that would contain a fetch rover to go collect those samples to bring them back to the lander. The lander, of course, will also have a, uh, a rocket on it, a Mars ascent vehicle. The samples will be loaded up into a container like we saw in this uh, image with the orange background there, uh, and then put onto the launch vehicle, sent into Mars orbit, where it would be collected by an orbiter, 
uh, and then the orbiter would return the samples back to us here on Earth. So again, we're currently working on these plans and um, we're working very hard to um, get permission to, to do this as a new start. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We're hoping to have good news uh, in the upcoming um, budget cycle for that. Mitch, just a quick time check. We're at a quarter till. Okay, I think I have uh, three more slides. So I think I should be good. Okay, so uh, this is fairly important. Where are we actually going to send the rover? Uh, we, through a series of workshops with the scientific community where people argued and debated for several years, uh, we had a series of four workshops. Uh, we finally have decided on uh, Jezero Crater as the landing site. Uh, so I guess you can't probably see it very well depending on how big your screen is, but the image on the right hand side is a topographic map of Mars. Uh, there are four black boxes with text in them. Um, there's a cluster of three. Uh, the one on the right hand side of that is labeled Jezero Crater, just to give you a sense for where it is. It's right at the edge of a large impact basin called Isidus. Um, but uh, Jezero Crater itself is a crater lake and or was a crater, an impact crater that filled with liquid water. And into that liquid water lake, uh, a river came in. And so the image that you see on the left hand side. Uh, on the very far left, you see the river channel. Uh, and then on the, in the middle of that picture, you see a beautiful delta that has formed inside that crater. So again, um, material came from through that uh, river system and was deposited into a delta inside the lake uh, in that crater. I've labeled some of the mineralogy that we see from orbit here. Um, and again, all of these are very interesting for a variety of reasons. Um, olivine uh, generally is the type of material that makes up the basalt uh, that makes up most of Mars. So if we were able to collect a sample of that, per perhaps we could get an age date for that crater uh, and for those deposits. Um, iron, magnesium, smectites are clay minerals that are particularly good at trapping organic material. Carbonate minerals, again, often form in these nice, quiet uh, lake environments where we often see um, organisms like stromatolites, like we see in Western Australia forming. Uh, so again, a really great site um, that might have preserved organic matter, um, provided some evidence for uh, liquid water alteration of the original rock materials, uh, and also pro probably has a volcanic unit that will uh, enable us to age date that again once the samples come back. So we won't be able to put those age dates on it uh, with Mars 2020, but uh, it would be important to collect a sample of that and bring back so that we could get those age dates. So that's where we're going. Um, so I just wanted to sort of finish up with a quick video here. So as I mentioned, the rover is assembled. Uh, this is uh, a short video of the rover undergoing what we call uh, the spin test. Uh, so what they have to do is make sure that everything is balanced as it's um, launching and flying to Mars. Uh, and so this is a, a short video of them doing this uh, spin balance test. It's sped up 28 times because uh, they actually spin it really not that fast, um, but they spin it relatively slowly um, so that we can um, make sure that everything's in balance. Uh, the rover it has under is right now undergoing environmental testing. It's uh, stacked with all the other pieces uh, of the, the cruise stage and the descent stage and the back shell and the heat shield. Um, and it will um, undergo testing for a little while and they'll take it out and unstack it and test all the individual parts again. Um, and I believe that the very first shipment of hardware to Cape uh, Canaveral, where the launch will be in July next year, will start this December. So things are getting very, very close to being very real for Mars 2020. So um, I want to give you a quick reminder. Uh, they mentioned at the beginning that you can send your name to Mars. So there's the website for that. Um, essentially what you do is you type in your name. Uh, it will give you a boarding pass. Uh, they will collect all the names and they will make uh, microchips and put everyone's name who submitted one onto the microchip and put it onto the rover. Uh, so your name will actually then fly to Mars. 
Uh, and then a reminder that um, K through 12 uh, school children are invited to submit an essay where they will give a, uh, an actual name to the rover. So we talk about the mission as Mars 2020, um, but the rover needs a name. So we have Curiosity, we had Spirit and Opportunity and uh, Sojourner. And so we wanna give this uh, rover a name as well. And so we're opening that competition up uh, to the kids to provide a good name for the rover. Uh, and then, as always, uh, if you want to know more about the Mars Exploration Program, all the great missions that we're doing, um, you can go to mars.nasa.gov, uh, and you can start there and get to all of those other things uh, there as well. And that's all I have. So I will leave you with Sunset on Mars, captured by Curiosity. So thank all right. you all. Thank you so much, Mitch. And so let's, uh, since uh, your camera's not functioning this evening and so we can't see you, let's go ahead and just leave this up for right now. And, and uh, okay. more interesting than looking at uh, uh, a red screen. So. <laughs> well, more interesting than looking at me. <laughs> we do have a few questions here. And so let's uh, see what we've got here. And so Bill uh, asked this a long time ago, and I think you might have addressed this, although it's uh, somewhat of a, mystery and you might you know reiterate this um, and so you're going to be caching some samples on Mars and so how exactly will the uh, return mission find them once uh, uh, once it goes up to retrieve them oh that's a good I, that's a good question so um, as you know we have a million cameras on this rover so we'll actually be able to uh, locate them very well in terms of where we leave them so it's not like we're just going to drop them and not pay attention to where we are so we'll actually pay very close attention to where uh, we where we are when we drop the samples on the ground. Um, so we'll locate that through various um, sets of imagery. We'll take pictures from orbit of where the rover is, like we can do right now with Curiosity. So we're able to take pictures of where it is. Uh, so we'll actually be able to um, to to do that pretty precisely in terms of um, making sure that we document exactly where we are when we when we when we drop those samples. All right. Well, since uh, we do have a lot of uh, astronomers on the call tonight, we have an astronomical question from Tom. Um, he's wondering about, uh, um, are there specific astronomical observations that are planned in advance, or will this be an evolving concept once on Mars? And I know that uh, Curiosity has made some uh, nighttime sky observations. Yeah, they're generally done just as uh, opportunities arise. I don't think anything is really um, particularly planned out because we have a surface mission that we have to do. Uh, but if we do get an opportunity and we want to, uh, you know, take some sky surveys, uh, we'll be able to do that. Um, the other interesting thing that Curiosity has been doing, and I'm sure we'll do once in a while with Mars 2020, is um, you know, taking images of uh, clouds as they go by, um, the dust devils that you know occasionally occur in particular areas and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but no, the astronomical observations are sort of, uh, they're not really planned very far in advance. Uh, again, they're just done as opportunities arise. All right. Um, so Robert asks, uh, what does the, uh, how much does the rover weigh and, and maybe give a comparison to Curiosity just so we have a sense of uh, some of the um, engineering logistics? Yeah, so the mass of Curiosity, I think the, the rover itself with everything on it was 800 and it is 899 kilograms, might be a little heavier now with some dust on it, um, but it's also losing mass out of the wheels, so maybe it's still about the same. Um, and Curi uh, Mars 2020, again, the, they're still racking that up, but my last estimate that I had was 1,050 kilograms, so about 50 kilograms heavier. So presumably they've scaled up the, uh, uh, the rest of the system to accommodate that, that it's not just uh, duplicating what uh, succeeded with Curiosity. So yeah, so Curiosity was actually designed to accommodate um, that large a mass as 2020, so we didn't really have to do too much more. Um, but we did, um, as I mentioned, the, the wheel design was changed a little bit to accommodate that because it, it will be a little bit heavier and we want to make sure we've, we've dealt with that. Uh, and we did slightly stretch the chassis just a tiny little bit. So we have, uh, we have done a few design, slight design modifications to accommodate the additional, um, the additional mass. 
So that's actually an interesting question and one that I didn't realize. You mentioned that uh, the 2020 Rover wheels were a little bit narrower uh, along with the other design changes. And what uh, I, I would have thought that uh, you know, from my kind of intuitive sense that narrower wheels might um, increase the um, potential for some damage. And so what was the thinking on narrower wheels? Yeah, so it, it turns out that having the wider wheel base on Curiosity is exposing more of the surface and just giving more uh, potential for um, sort of flexor points. And so they, they narrowed it a little bit to, to cut down on that, but they did, uh, again, um, increase the thickness of the wheels a little bit to, uh, to sort of make up for that. Uh, it, it also will help um, with some of the, the rock mechanics. And so they, they did all these uh, studies um, when they started having the trouble with Curiosity. Uh, and it, it turns out that having the wheels be a little bit narrower actually turns out to be a little bit better because you don't have the wider surface to, uh, to cause the problem. Okay. So William asked the question, uh, what was the scale on the map of Jezero Crater? Uh, how much of the delta would the 21 kilometer range take up? Right, that's a good question. So the, the, the crater itself is 40 kilometers across. And so the delta itself is only on the order of about 10 kilometers across. And then if you go up into the hills, I know that that's uh, one of the goals that I saw on the, on the path was to get up into the hills, um, yeah. which I think is where the basalt layers are. Is that correct? So the basalt unit is actually in the floor of the crater. And so oh, we'll, okay. Yeah, so we'll probably land, um, well, the simulation sort of put us um, right at the, either at the, uh, just off the eastern part of the delta or on top of the delta. Uh, and so either way, we would have to, you know, drive one way or the other. Um, but again, that's well within the 20 kilometers that we that we've uh, kept there. Okay. So um, Anthony asks about the uh, rover's expected lifetime. And we know that uh, um, the rovers that we've set up there have exceeded their lifetime. One can't, you know, expect that. But, uh, you know, realistically, um, you've got kind of that built-in warranty uh, for it, but what are your, you know, ultimate, uh, I guess, hopes for the rover? Yeah, so uh, again, we're, we're designing it, um, we're qualifying everything for one and a half Mars years, which is three years here on Earth, so that's a fairly long time. Um, Curiosity was designed to last one Mars year, so we've added another half a year on Mars, which is another year here on Earth. Um, and, you know, sort of depending on how things go with the sample return campaign, uh, it may be nice to have Mars 2020 around when, the, when we actually start flying those missions. So, uh, you know, we're hopeful that it'll be around uh, at least that long. Uh, and again, it's nuclear powered, uh, so we'll have enough power to last us for, you know, a couple of decades uh, from that perspective. Um, yeah, curiosity. Uh, Curiosity has been there for seven, a little over seven years now. Spirit lasted six years, Opportunity 14 and a half. So uh, they have a pretty good track record of building these things. So we're hopeful that it'll last a while. All right, well, this will be our last question. And this is from Ray. He asks, what is the age of Jezero Crater and how is it determined? You know, we don't have the rocks to do the um, dating on. Uh, so, you know, how do we do yep. that? Great question. So the age estimate for Jezero Crater is on the order of three and a half billion years. So again, um, that ain't those ancient kinds of terrain that we we're looking for when we when Mars was uh, warmer and wetter. So we're in the right time frame. The way that they estimate those age dates is um, by counting the number of craters in a particular area. Uh, and then looking at, for example, uh, the calibrations of the cratering record on the moon uh, and understanding how old those are. So again, a lot more impacts early in the history of the solar system because there was a lot more debris around. So they essentially do uh, crater density counting uh, and then use that to put the ages on it. But this is actually one of the things that we're uh, hoping to get once we 
bring samples back is an actual age of some of the rock units so that that can help us uh, constrain those crater counting ages as well. But that's a great question. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Schulte, for joining us. This is fantastic. I love to hear all of these. As a, as a fellow geologist, I always uh, appreciate these missions that are out to, uh, you know, uh, look at some of the different rocks and uh, try to determine the history of, of a place. Um, so thank you so much for uh, joining us and for all the great information. Well, thank you guys for uh, dialing in this evening. <laughs>